Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the board of directors. Once you have got all of these directors around a table and they all understand their individual fiduciary duties, how they need to deal with conflicts of interest, and they understand their personal liability, if they ever breach any of those fiduciary duties or fail to disclose or manage any conflicts of interest, and how they manage the company once they're all sitting around the table. Let's just have a look at how boards are composed. This is in terms of the Companies Act and King 4. So the composition of a board really depends very much on what the company requires. Companies can be very small and they can be very big and they have different requirements for that governance responsibility that a board would discharge. So consideration needs to be given to, to what the company actually requires. A company with a very, very large board could become quite unwieldy. A lot of people trying to put through their decisions and, and, and their opinions and their input can be quite difficult to manage and refine out the good ideas. But you need to have enough people to make sure that you have a sufficient diversity of balance of skills and experience. And you need to have the right caliber of people on your board. They need to have the right level of experience, the right type of qualifications, the diversity of qualifications, and they need to also have a diversity of age and experience. We need to consider that the majority should be non-executive, particularly as you get into your larger companies and the JSE starts playing a role. You need to have sufficient directors such that the independent non-executives are available to meet the committee requirements that King talks about and that the JSE might require from a larger company. Demographics are obviously very important, not purely from a representational point of view, but because that diversity of skill, experience, age, gender, race, all adds to the value of the discussion that happens around the boardroom table. Listed companies need to have an actual policy for how they go about appointing directors, which considers these diversity elements, particularly around gender and race, but also around other aspects. If you think about it, a lot of companies are marketing their products to millennials and they're going into a digital space. But there are no boards that actually have a millennial on their board, which is very unusual and I think something the boards need to consider. It illustrates the point of how important that diversity is to these discussions and deliberations. Typically, this role will fall to the nomination committee to go through what the boards require, what its needs are, what would be an optimal fit. They will decide who goes onto this board or how they make the nominations for this board. They'll do very important background checks on, on the people that they nominate for the board. And then once those appointments have been finalized, they'll prepare a formal letter of appointment for those directors and off they go into their appointment space. And we'll talk a little bit later about how one then continues to ensure that directors give the value that they need to to companies through induction programs and through um, independent valuations and uh, evaluations of their performance. From a Companies Act perspective, though, there are some minimum requirements around the boards of companies and how many people sit on each of those boards. Nonprofit companies need to have at least three directors, whether they have members or not. Private companies, if you've just got one person who's a, a sole shareholder, can also be a director, that's absolutely fine. Private companies are structured in such a way that they can be as simple as possible. They can literally be a one-man show. So one shareholder who is also a director, that's absolutely fine. But then once we start getting into bigger companies, um, public companies will require more directors, more people on the board, the thinking being that you're impacting more stakeholders once you become a public company, you need more oversight. So you need to have a minimum of three directors there. If you are a listed company, you will need to have a minimum of four. State-owned companies need to have a minimum of three. Do bear in mind 
with a public company and a state-owned company, they are going to be required to have audit committees. That, as a consequence of the Companies Act, can't be avoided. And audit committees can only be constituted of independent, non-executive directors, and it must have a minimum of three of them. So there's your three independent, non-executive directors. However, once you then overlay onto that the recommendation by King that the chairman of the board not be a member of the audit committee, one has to then think about having that fourth independent director. Personal liability companies, just to come back to that, operate substantially the same as private companies and they are only required to have one director. Let's have a look at what King says about boards and board compositions, particularly with regards to how we expect our boards to act. The very first principle in King is that the board should lead ethically and effectively. There should be continuous development around the competent competencies, I beg your pardon, for effective leadership. The board should be ethical in order to ensure that this effective leadership results in achieving the strategic object objectives of the company and positive outcomes for the company. So just to break that down a little bit. There can never be an unethical decision which is in the best interests of the company. What is ethical can be quite difficult sometimes for a board to assess. On the face of it, right and wrong in terms of an ethical evaluation might be quite easy to make. But when dealing with the practicalities of the world in which we live, ethics can be quite a challenge. Nevertheless, whenever a board is sitting down to consider its strategic objectives and how the company is going to achieve those strategic objectives positively it, with consideration to all of its stakeholders, it needs to have an ethical foundation from which it operates. Then all the directors and the board collectively and the people to whom they delegate down to need to be accountable for the ethical leadership that they have over this company and in order to assist them to do that, that that effective delegation down maintaining that ethical basis the board needs to develop charters terms of reference if you will exactly the same thing that set out the role the responsibilities of its various committees its management structures how they pro procedures for how they conduct themselves um, how they function effectively, and then those charters and terms of reference would need to be um, reviewed on a regular basis. And there's a little cartoon just to give you a lighter moment amongst all the serious talk. Principle six then goes on to really hone in on that responsibility of the board around being the focal point of corporate governance for the company. King says the board should exercise its leadership by one, setting the strategic direction for the company. Remember that that is the foremost responsibility of the board, is to de determine the company's strategy. And in doing so, it obviously needs to have that ethical basis. Once it's developed its strategy, it needs to then implement its strategy, which it would do through policies and delegations of authority, various procedures and plans. It needs to make sure that management implement all of those policies, plans and procedures that are going to give that, strate that strategy its life. And then they need to make sure that everybody in that value chain remains accountable for the performance of the group. Ultimately, accountability will come back up to the board. How we measure accountability is through disclosures. So in doing this, the board would set out a charter or a terms of reference for the board, setting out its own roles and responsibilities and how it conducts itself and that for its committees. It'll have a protocol in respect of how its members maintain their independence, how they obtain professional advice, how the company can support them in that regard and would be the, for the company's costs. And any matters that are within the scope of the board, how those will be managed. And we'll discuss those in detail just now.
They also need to have a protocol for how non-executive directors receive and request information from the company. So typically in a boardroom scenario, when we're preparing for a board meeting, we prepare board packs of information. And those of you who practice as company secretaries on a regular basis will be very familiar with the concept of board packs. However, we have to assess the content that goes into those packs is it sufficient information for somebody who is a non-executive director, not involved in the day-to-day -day business of the company? Can they use this information to assess sufficiently and make good decisions for the company? If they need further information from the company, how do they go about getting that information? Principally, directors are entitled to all the information that's available in the company. There's nothing that can be hidden from a director. But how they go about getting that information would need to have some sort of a formal process around it. And then when the board reports back to its, stake, its shareholders and its stakeholders generally, the board needs to disclose the number of meetings that it had and whether or not it's satisfied that it actually met those responsibilities set out in the charter during that period. The charter obviously setting out all of its role, its responsibilities related to its role and its procedures and how it goes about making its decisions. Okay, principle seven of, of King really emphasizes this importance of having this balance of skills, knowledge, experience, diversity, and independence in order for this board to discharge its responsibilities effectively and objectively. We've had a lot of discussion around diversity already and how it has its values, but when the board is considering who sits on the board, how many people, how are we going to uh, um, put this board together, the board needs to consider holistically how we are going to collaborate between board members, how are the committees going to co collaborate, how are there going to be complementary roles that overlap, how are we going to balance power so that nobody has one overarching dominant decision-making role, how is it that we can structure our board in such a way that we can get all the value of all of that diverse experience from our directors so that we can make really good decisions. How are we going to delegate down to certain committees and make sure that each committee understands what it is that they have to do and where there's an overlap, how they deal with it, and to ensure that there is no individual who dominates all of these proceedings. Once we've got our board together and we know how they're going to be composed and they go about doing their, their duties, we need to make sure that as a decision-making body, we continue to deliver a high standard of performance. The best way to do that is to regularly evaluate the performance of the board. And that's where principle nine comes in from King, saying that the board should evaluate its performance and that of its committees and its chair and its individual members to support the continued improvement of its performance effectiveness. Once it's done this evaluation process, it needs to disclose what that evaluation process covered and what came out of it. So King asks the board to disclose to, to stakeholders how often it had these performance evaluations, how it was conducted, what was the scope of those evaluations, were they done on a formal or informal basis, did you have them uh, done internally and we will have a look at how you can do them internally or did we get an external service provider to come and assist? What was the remedial actions that came out of, of the, the results? And are we happy as a board that that evaluation process is going to uh, improve our performance and our effectiveness? Principle 10 focuses on this importance of ensuring that when the board is going to delegate responsibility down for implementing strategy, that that structure that sits underneath the board is properly has proper oversight and is properly constituted. And uh, principle 10 says, the board should ensure that the appointment and delegation to management 
contributes to role clarity and the effective exercise of authorities and responsibilities. This speaks specifically to your delegation of authority. So when the board has its strategy, they decide that this is the business plan they're going to follow, they delegate to the CEO and the CFO and the other executive directors to implement it. These executive directors obviously then delegate further down and it goes down into subsidiary companies if we're talking about a holding company structure, what can be decided at what different levels to ensure that effective management, collectively corporate governance for the whole group of companies is managed well. The board then needs to make a statement to its stakeholders to say that it is satisfied that its delegation of authority framework is actually effective in, in delivering this performance and managing the authority and the responsibilities of all the members in the company. Okay, so let's go back and have a look specifically at the role of the board. Obviously, a company must have an effective board dedicated to ensuring that the company achieves these strategic objectives. The entire purpose of having this company is to ensure that it's going to actually deliver a business model and add value to its shareholders and create that value to its stakeholder group and be a responsible member of society. In doing so, the board needs to make sure that the company operates as an ethical organization and it meets those corporate governance obligations. Those corporate governance obligations being very broad in terms of legislation, regulation, codes of ethics, recommended practices such as King and the company's own internal policies. As we've seen, King says the primary roles and responsibilities for the board include setting and steering the direction of the company's strategy, approving that policy and plans and uh, the procedures that will give effect to implementing that strategy and ensuring that the people who then have this work delegated down to them through the policies and the plans are accountable for it and they report back on what they've done. And then the board needs to continuously oversee and monitor the implementation and the, ac the execution of the strategy. The entire purpose of this being that we create a company which is based on an ethical culture that performs well, that has effective control measures. So when things go wrong or when we put information out in the market, how do we know that they are right? How do we know that we've managed our risks properly? And as a result of all of that, we have a legitimacy with our stakeholders. Our stakeholders can genuine, genuinely believe that this company is managed well. The board will need to reserve certain matters for itself. It will determine its strategy and then it will delegate the actual work down to management. But in terms of making decisions, there are certain matters that the board must reserve for itself. Ultimately, it's going to be responsible for everything notwithstanding any type of delegation that it's have, and it continues to be this focal point and the custodian of corporate governance. Typically, those matters that only the board will consider that it reserves for itself, obviously, strategy, the development, implementation, monitoring the performance of strategy. Strategy is developed through a collaborative process with the board in discussion with the CEO and the executives who will be close to the action, who understand the industry very, very well. They will recommend certain strategic imperatives to the board. And with all that lovely diversity of knowledge, the board members will debate and discuss and refine this, this strategy. The capital structure. Once you have a strategy, somehow you've got to pay for that. You've got to have the money to put that into play. And that includes how much levels of debt you take on. You will have seen a lot of uh, prolific content in the media on an ongoing basis around companies' levels of debt and how well that's managed. On the, end, the other side of debt is equity, which is your share capital. Are we going to do rights issues? How many shareholders do we have? How much money can we get from our shareholders to put into this business? Versus how much debt are we going to take from funders 
collectively we get our financial pot together so that we can pay for the strategy. Then we need to have very solid financial reporting and uh, financial, beg your pardon, financial reporting and controls that are in place to ensure that when we roll out the strategy and we pay for it, how are we going to manage those finances and report back? There's a lot of legislative requirements around financial reporting. And if you're in a listed environment, you have substantial um, compliance requirements from IFRS that come to you through the JSE. How you then take that money, the surplus money, and you give it back to your shareholders is very, very highly regulated by the Companies Act in terms of um, Section 4 through the Solvency and Liquidity Test. Our internal controls, how we manage the processes internally in the company, that also needs to be something that the board considers on an ongoing basis. This is where you're going to make sure that you eliminate mistakes and you eliminate fraud. Any major contracts over a certain amount. So where there's a small contract where we're going to take on a new photocopier in the company, the board may not be very interested in that and they may delegate responsibility for making those decisions down to the CEO. But where there's a big contract for a tender to deliver on a strategic imperative over a, a, a large amount of money, that would might be something that the board would be, be particularly interested in, in assessing and considering. There's going to be a lot of risks that come with that. Communication to the public. It seems somewhat obvious but if you think about how many people can work in a large company and how we talk to each other across social media platforms how company information can be distributed very easily prolifically through the marketplace and that information may not necessarily be correct so we need as a board to make sure that when we communicate with the public we do it in a very structured very formal way and only those people who are authorized to communicate with the public do so and when they communicate they deliver a message that the board as a whole has agreed on is the message that needs to go into the public domain Information going into the public domain can have a substantial impact, not only from a reputational point of view, but directly onto the company's share price, particularly if it, in, in a listed environment and um, rumors and conjecture can damage shareholder value through that share price. The board obviously needs to make sure that it is responsible for how it is um, constituted, its membership, and how appointments are made. And this would include shareholders who want to appoint representatives onto the board. They may do so under certain circumstances, how shareholders' agreements might be structured in an unlisted environment. Generally, the whole constitution of that board. And then how the board goes about paying the members of the board is a matter of concern. So if you have a strategy and you need to roll it out and you need to have the skills to do that, that whole board constitution is based around those skills, that whole fabulous diversity of skills, you need to expect to pay those people. But that payment needs to be done in a way that is fair and reflects delivery of the strategy. This is why you will see non-executive directors are paid a fixed rate. They cannot be tainted by the company's performance, but executive directors, their remuneration is driven substantially by how the company performs and how it delivers its strategy. Then, of course, the delegation of authority, how the board delegates down all that responsibility. And every time you see delegation of authority, you must also automatically think Part of that is how the reporting comes back up to the board from those people to whom responsibility has been delegated. So the board ultimately always knows what's happening and the board is always going to be accountable for the actions that it's delegated down. The entire corporate governance performance of the company, how well these governance structures are being monitored and managed and implemented, the company ultimately must be seen to be a good member of society and have strong corporate governance. And then any significant policies, again using our example around the photocopier, any small policies around um, leave may be something that the board doesn't want to get involved in, it's not 
a matter that the, should consume the board. So it's very operational. That can be delegated to management. But significant policies around lending, debt structures, level, levels of risk, how, what, what, at what point we want to get certain insurance involved when we have large contracts, those policies should come to the board. Okay, so we've looked at King and we've looked at the Companies Act and we've considered how this board um, is, is structured. We now need to have a conversation around how this board can be effective. We've talked about composition of the board, but the personality and the style of the CEO is important. Typically, these will be people who have some maturity in their business. This is why we have these old gray men as chairman, because they've seen it all, because they have this experience. And when I say old gray men, I use it as, a, as an example of somebody with experience, but there is nothing saying that a, a blonde lady can't also be a, a chairman of a company. And uh, there are many examples of, of, of that taking place. But um, the point being that this is an experienced person who has been in the boardroom for a long time and understands how to bring all of that value out of those individual members and how to run a productive meeting. There is nothing worse than a chairman who likes the sound of his own voice and sits and rambles throughout the entire meeting and nobody contributes anything. Ultimately, I mean, alternatively, a chairman who sits and um, just does nothing and allows all the other members to just talk in an unwieldy manner and doesn't keep to an agenda, we're not going to get a very productive meeting. We're not going to make good decisions. We're not going to get that value out. How the, the climate of the board meeting is, is established and uh, do people have a great deal of fear when they come into a meeting? Do they feel comfortable being able to talk and give their opinions? Remember when you come up, when you sit around a boardroom table and you talk and you give opinions and you, and you have dissent, you do put yourself personally a little bit on the line there. Um, how can we get these directors to be brave, make big decisions, give this contribution and create that right environment? There has to be, in a healthy board, the idea that they have a common purpose around the discharging the strategy of the company and they have to understand their roles in, in doing so. They have to work collectively. Quite often we have diverse opinions and that's, that's what we want. We want diversity, but we also have to have the emotional maturity to allow ourselves to be persuaded by other people's opinions when, when we believe they are right and they have produced factual evidence to that. We can't just stick wholeheartedly to our guns. We have to believe that we can, we can work together as a collective. We have to consider how this information comes to the board and what information comes to the board and in what form and how do we consume that information. Information coming to the board is going to be the basis of an effective decision. So the quality of the information is important and we will talk about that a little bit later on. A board also needs to identify and focus on substantive issues which add value. There is no point in getting this group of people around the table and we spend an awful lot of time talking about something that is insignificant to the company that does not drive the strategy or is not relevant to a current issue. So, for example, activists are saying boards that are not focusing on climate when they talk around their strategy are missing a substantive issue. How we talk about climate must be relative and important to that business. We've talked about the, the membership of these boards being diverse and competent. Every member must be able to add that value, bearing in mind their fiduciary duties around their subjective and objective skills test. The board must understand the rules and procedures that manage its structure. So they must understand what the charter says and they must understand how the authority has been delegated. If they have delegated responsibility for a certain decision, they can take it back, but 
where does that play in, in the structure? How does one do that? At what points do they make the decisions and at what points do they need to delegate them down? We've talked about flow of information to the board. We need to make sure that that's accurate, that it arrives on time and that it's complete and comprehensive. Old, redundant information is useless. We do provide our board packs to our directors um, typically within five days of the meeting. Sometimes there might be a lot of information and one would wish you could give it a bit uh, sooner to them and give them more time to read it, but sometimes it would then take away the timeliness of the information and the ability for the information to com be complete and accurate. When a management team receives instructions from the board to do a certain thing where it's been delegated down, it then needs to report, down, report back on that progress. So where you see delegation, you must always think of the obligation to report back. And the board needs to make sure that that reporting back process is adequate. The committees that the board has set up need to be well constituted, they need to be well run and they need to be full of the right type of people. So your audit committee needs to be people who are financially literate. It doesn't mean that they all have to be accountants, it does mean that they need to understand financials, but there will be other risks attached to the finances of the company, such as law, uh, legal aspects that might come up, internal controls risk management, those sort of aspects, the audit committee also needs those skills to consider. So there's value in that diversity of, of skills. A nominations committee would need to be made up of people who were well versed in induction programs and in board evaluations and possibly ongoing education. A remuneration committee would need to be populated with people who understood structured remuneration and how it can deliver a strategy. When you have this entire framework of a board with all of its committees and it's delegated down to executives and it starts going into subsidiary companies, you need to understand um, and be assured that there are clear levels of communication and trust in all of those processes, particularly between the non-executive structure, being the board as a whole, and the executive structure headed up by the CEO, and then from the CEO down to his management structure, and from that management structure further down, you need to make sure that we don't end up with a case of broken telephone. Everybody's hearing the same message. Everybody's feeding back the same message. And in all of this, we need to make sure that we have adequate systems of risk management and control. And when we look at risk, we need to do it in a combined way. We need to look at our external risks, our internal risks, how management manages risks, and we need to combine all of that together and, um, and have assurance processes that support good control. If you always remember that you have your strategy and you're going out with your strategy, you want to deliver your strategy, the enemy of strategy is risk. So you need to understand what those risks are if you're going to deliver the strategy effectively. The board may then spend time on other issues, compliance matters, formal processes around accessing information, in, uh, uh, assuring, a bigger pardon, obtaining independent advice, um, deciding on how it is constituted, risk areas, non-financial risk, uh, non-financial aspects of the business, how those are monitored, um, going concern assumptions, which we will talk about um, in, in other aspects of, of governance, explaining and, and delegating a process around how board resolutions are taken and how they are then implemented in the business encouraging shareholders to, to participate in general meetings and ensuring that when we do have general meetings of shareholders, who attends those meetings and uh, particularly the chairman of the audit committee and the remuneration committee. So there might be other things that the board has a duty that come out of King. Let's just have a look at what a board charter might contain. Definitely responsibility for the strategic plans. 
monitoring operational performance, monitoring the performance of management in actually doing the work required around the implementation of that strategy, determining those significant policies and procedures that are important for the strategy, risk management, internal controls, the communication policy, director selection, induction of directors, evaluation of directors on an ongoing basis, how we concern ourselves with our performance, and then determining a balance between governance and the relative constraints that good governance places on us and entrepreneurial performance, because you don't also want to stifle the ability of a, of a group of people to make good business decisions. So uh, when Steve Jobs went to the board of Apple and suggested that they implement and, and roll out um, an iPad that was entre entrepreneurial um, and very revolutionary at its time, and the governance element of that would be, what are the risks? How do we implement this with re reducing those risks? Who are we going to hire from a technical perspective to do this? How are we going to market it? How are we going to make sure that we remain dominant in a market area, that this is a successful business practice? How are we going to report back? So those would be the governance areas, but we don't want those governance areas to constrain that wonderful entrepreneurial spirit, which is the whole reason that we have the company in the first place. Just reflecting on this slide and the contents of this board charter, you will notice that this is going to reflect those matters that are reserved for the board. Let's talk about the flow of information to the board. So if directors have to make decisions, and as directors they have their fiduciary duties to discharge, to act in the best interests of the company, they are very dependent on the information that they receive. And the business judgment rule is substantially based in, in that information, that a director made a decision with good information in hand. And if that information was bad, but it was came from a suitably appointed person and this director had done everything reasonable to believe that the information was good, he will be um, excused from a decision which ultimately was, was, was not good for the company and he will be still to be seen as having maintained his fiduciary duties. So let's have a, have a closer look at this flow of information to the board. Um, the Financial Reporting Council in the UK uh, was the first to come out with some directives around information and they put it, to get, put it out there quite nicely, quite succinctly. The board should be supplied in a timely manner, information in a form and of a quality appropriate to enable it to discharge its duties. So that's the most concise and consolidated way of, of of describing the information that the board requires. Key elements to good decision making. It must be timely information. It doesn't help if information is months old by the time it re reaches the board. There is a financial reporting process that happens in the background and any of you who are listening to this and might be involved in that understand you have you do your monthly accounts and you get to the end of the month and then there's a process that goes through a couple of weeks in order to get to the quality of information where you've got to refine it and then you've got to take it to your board. In order to ensure that it's accurate, you have to have gone through various processes to make sure that the information you're giving to the board is accurate. That takes a bit of time. So the information may only flow to the board possibly even three to four weeks after that end of that financial month, which is already quite a quite a distance in time, but you have to balance timely and accurate. It has to be relevant information, not only relevant in terms of still being timely, but relevant in terms of content. So if we are going to be considering making a, a certain decision around a, a contract, we need to make sure that we understand the risks that are related to that particular contract, um, the costs involved, 
and anything that is relevant to that particular matter. Information which is irrelevant, a director may not necessarily understand is so irrelevant and they may end up taking into into account information that is not focused and they may consume a lot of time in doing so lose focus on what is really important issues so relevance is critical no information can be kept from a board it's important to understand that a director in exercising their fiduciary duties has the right to ask for any information. But we need to not give them all the information. We'll completely flood these people out. So to the point of relevance, we need to make sure that they have the right information. If they request more information, then that must be given to them. The Companies Act Section 66 says, says that directors must exercise all the powers of the company. And King 3 goes on to say that they must have unrestricted access to all the company's information, records, documents, property, management, staff, but subject to a process that the board has established. Imagine for the poor debtor's clerk sitting there one day in her office, typing away, doing her thing, and the chairman of the audit committee comes in and asks her for certain information. It's not going to be a particularly productive way of finding information and the poor debtor's clerk is going to be completely unnerved by the process and the CEO will probably be quite annoyed that he wasn't informed. So a process needs to be established for non-executive directors to gain this information from the company and um, it will typically include uh, a process where the, the CEO is notified and he passes um, on, on responsibility to the relevant management areas to pass that information on. It's not to vet the information before it goes to the board um, and it's not to try and hide information from the board, but so that information is passed in an orderly manner. This access to information is always going to be important for directors to discharge their fiduciary duties. When we come back to the Companies Act section, 76 to B says there is this duty on directors to communicate information to the board unless it's immaterial or confidential. So those directors do need to have, have information at hand um, which they can communicate. They must also be able to obtain information externally from the company. So we would have a policy about how they are obtained information internally from the company, but from the from external sources, um, industry experts, markets, uh, things that are specific to the economy, key stakeholders, professional advisors, directors should still have access to that information and that information can be provided at a cost to a company. So if there is an external report, um, specific industry report that the directors need in order to make a decision, then the company must arrange for that report to be provided to them. When looking at all of this information that we have in a company and then assessing what needs to go to the board, we must be sure that we, um, we only send the relevant information and, and we don't overload them with, with irrelevant information. We must be cognizant of um, the amount of information and the nature of the information that's given. Quarterly board meetings are a typical practice for directors because it gives them that opportunity to review the company um, on, an, on a sufficiently adequate basis and maybe they will have monthly updates on key highlights um, which will keep them abreast of, of, of timely activities that the company is going under. And then all information to the board must be given to them within sufficient time to consider it to make a decision. So this is not necessarily dealing with the concept of timely information, but when you give information to the board, please don't give it to them on the morning of the board meeting. Give it to them at least five days beforehand so they can go through it, so they can deliberate. Is this information relevant? Is this information sufficient? Do I need to ask more questions or do I need to ask for more information? And that's very important. I know it can be quite a painful process for a company secretary to have to try and get information to the board in a, on, on a deadline, but uh, it's very important that directors 
have that opportunity to consider it um, adequately before they make decisions, that is part of their fiduciary duties. Let's have a look at board deliberations. Once we've got our information and we're sitting around the table and we have duly understood our role as a collective, we need to be sure that no director has their discretion fettered um, by any other director or by some external undue influence from a shadow director, um, some nefarious agenda that is external to the company. Directors need to be able to contribute to constructive board decisions. The board as a whole should aim to reach agreement on all issues. Even if they disagree or they start from a point of digression, they need to have a good conversation that brings them all together. Even where they do disagree with a decision, they may still support that decision that the collective has made, and that's perfectly fine. But in order to do so, and in order to be a good contributing member of a board, that individual needs to have a strength of character. They need to be able to ask questions. They need to make demands for, for relevant answers, for the sufficient degree of detail. Um, management may push back. They need to, to, to have the, the, the strength of character to continue to to ask those questions and, and keep the discussion diverse and relevant and, and on a critical basis. What we don't want is a board where everyone agrees um, just so that the peace is kept, that the, uh, the climate is nice. And this is typically what you might find in a board where fear is a big factor or where you have a very dominant character like a dominant chairman or a dominant CEO. There are instances though where the majority of the board will agree on something and a director will still disagree. He must make his views known. There are certain instances where it is important for a director to vote against a decision and this particularly relates to section 4 of the Companies Act and the solvency and liquidity test where either the test has not been applied or the company has failed the test but the act action is still going to be go ahead such as a distribution or a buyback um, or financial assistance that might be granted. Uh, as a minute taker, if you find yourself in that position in a board, it's important to note that uh, any directors who voted against something, that that be recorded in the minutes. But collectively as a whole, we try and aim for agreement, try and avoid these dominant personalities that may stop that robust debate from taking place. Bearing in mind that the executives will always have an inherent conflict of interests. They will always have an inherent leaning towards company earnings. They have remuneration structures that are based on earnings. Um, and, and this is also why it's important to have a remuneration structure that gives CEOs that balance and executive directors that balance. So it's not only around short-term gains. So when we have these debates in, in meetings, we can try and limit some of that conflict of interest. To have this balance and objective discussion at, at a board and to have a, a deliberation that, that reflects that balance and objectivity, we need to ensure that no one individual has excessive powers. And in order to do so, it helps to have a majority of non-executive directors. They counterweight that executive director inherent conflict and that a majority of those non-executive directors should be independent. Problems do arise on a board, though. We are all human. And we need to deal with problems when they do arise in a constructive manner. Dissent is permitted, as I've mentioned, and every director must protect their ability to act in an unfettered way. Conflicts of interest are the biggest area of, of discrepancy, and so it's very important that conflicts are disclosed, 
and where a conflict exists that that director is then recused. Where there is a conflict, it might be helpful to get an external uh, professional to come in and help. The idea being though that the common area of concern is around completeness and accuracy of the information provided. So the non-executive directors who don't work in the company on a day-to-day -day basis may be at some disadvantage against the directors who the executive directors, I beg your pardon, who work with this information on a daily basis. But differences of opinion may still arise. It's important to assure, ensure that all matters are addressed logically and in a transparent manner, that there is appropriate information, that any misinterpretations of fact that have arisen are dealt with, and where there is a technical issue, something that is outside of the realm of the expertise of these directors, that they take professional independent advice. Where you might see this on a regular basis is around IFRS reporting, the International Financial Reporting Council and their standards of, of reporting that can be incredibly technical and um, in order to ensure that that financial reporting complies with the IFRS standards, you may very well need an IFRS compliance expert to come and advise your board on how certain things need to be done and that is absolutely fine. Decisions usually, once they are put to a vote, it is the majority that have to, an ordinary majority is what applies to a boardroom vote. So it would be 50 plus one. The Companies Act doesn't necessarily allow for the chairman to have a deciding vote unless the MOI says that he may. So make sure that you understand if the MOI and whether the MOI does provide for that chairman to have a deciding vote. If the, if the MOI is silent on it, then the, M, the chairman would not have a deciding vote and make sure he understands that too. Where you have dissenting directors, they may go along and support as we have discussed. If they are in an extreme situation, they may actually resign. And where, as I've mentioned, there are any issues that relate to the solvency and liquidity test being applied, this is Section 4 of the Companies Act where it has not been applied or it has failed, but the action has still gone ahead. Directors who voted against the action, i.e. our dissenting directors, they would not have personal liability for any of the damages caused as a consequence of failing to apply that solvency and liquidity test. On the softer matters of dealing with dissent, which happens every day in life, as a matter of course. A good chairman must try and resolve these conflicts amicably and constructively. And in so doing, there's some soft skills that we look to these chairmen, these experienced people to assist us with. Contrary views must be given a proper hearing. All relevant facts must be available. There's no point in us having a debate about information that's incorrect. We must understand what the nature of our disagreement is and make an informed decision. Quite often, we don't understand that uh, we may actually be discussing a topic that we both agree on, but we're discussing it from different perspectives and there isn't necessarily a disagreement or the, what the, the matter we're disagreeing over is not in itself clear. There is no decision that can ever be taken regardless of how a board votes, that is contrary to the law or the company's code of ethics. There can be, the, vote, the, the board could vote and, and pass a resolution to do something, but if it was contrary to the law, it wouldn't be a valid decision and the board as a whole would have to deal with the consequences of that. Likewise, neglecting the company's code of ethics would also bring those that board under scrutiny and those individual directors in terms of their fiduciary duties. Typically, any board would, uh, would need to ensure that it had the proper advice where there was a technical matter or professional independent assurance that was required. 
once a matter has been put to the vote and um, the vote has, has passed, the majority need to respect the views of the minority and, and the minority need to respect the reviews of the majority. Where a board has a decision to make, but there is not sufficient information there for them to make that decision, they must postpone that decision until proper information is available. Where you have dissenting positions, including resignations, these must be formally communicated on an unbiased way and with the appropriate degree of transparency. Okay, let's have a look at some little uh, diagrams here that just assist a look in, in a graphic representation of the board coming around the table and what it is that they might discuss and how they might go about their business. So as they sit around the table, they'll be looking at broad policies, um, explaining and reporting back performance to shareholders, would include things like decisions around dividends, budgets, appointing management, executive management, and, um, and, and how they go about remunerating those executive managers. Here's another little graphic illustration that would help you look at those four components of um, strategy, execution, how one deals with succession planning and transition. At the end of the day, the governance objective will be around impact oversight and ensuring that ongoing succession. This is just another way of having a look at a governance structure. Let's have a look at succession planning in particular though. We've had these lengthy discussions around the board and what it does and how it deliberates and what makes a healthy deliberation for a board. What if we take out one of those members of that board and we need to replace them? How do we go about doing that in a way that ensures that that board remains healthy and that the strategy remains alive and everything continues to be sustainable for the company? Particular board members and particular key management members are therefore critical to the business. And we need to ensure that if they are ever taken out of the picture for some reason, that there is somebody there to pick up their position, to fill that void in a way that will be seamless. Obviously, the chairman, any of the chairman of the committees, the CEO, the COO, the CFO, the managing directors of subsidiary companies, key operational positions. If you have a highly technical environment, your chief technical officer, sometimes those technical skills are very hard to find and uh, replacing a person with that degree of knowledge might be difficult. So you need to have succession plans, formal succession plans in place for all of these people. And they can be succession plans for a permanent appointment. So what we, we're going to appoint someone who will be in this position permanently or where it might be difficult to appoint someone immediately, an emergency appointment. For those, see, typically those very high um, risk areas like the CEO, the CFO, who can step in on an emergency basis and still ensure that financial reporting is done, still ensure that the operational activities happen, that where we have technical skills, that there is somebody who can still provide those skills. So we need to go through a process of identifying suitable candidates for those permanent and emergency responsibilities, that there is sufficient capacity and planning and resources committed to ensuring that those um, candidates will be able to be mentored and developed to the point where they could stand in, either on a permanent or possibly on an emergency basis. We need to review our succession plans periodically and we need to update them. There's nothing worse than having a succession plan where you've invested in a, in a candidate and then they leave the company, but nobody updated the succession plan. An emergency happens and, and that we don't have a we don't we have a big hole and no one has planned for what should happen to fill that hole. This is also a wonderful opportunity to integrate into um into your succession plans, the, the best practices around um, BE regulations and your skills development. So your skills development plan should be aligned 
with your succession plan so that those skills that you are investing in are going to contribute to your BE structure in your company, which is very important. When you do put someone, bring someone new in through a succession plan, you need to make sure, particularly at board level, that um, consideration is given to the changing strategic requirements of the company, particularly with regards to skills and experience and diversity. We live in a very fluid world and things change rapidly. And we need to make sure that when we bring our successes in um, and our succession plan supports, that ability for new skills to come in and for skills that are going to improve our levels of experience and improve our levels of diversity. One of the reasons that the JSE has the um, gender and racial diversity policy that boards are required to have is so that when you move out of, move a typically an old white man out of a position for whatever reason, that they take that opportunity to consider diversity by replacing that person with a, with a person of a different gender and a different race, um, and possibly even some new skills and a new outlook on, on the world as a, whole, as a whole. Right, when we get new directors who come into the company, this can be somebody who's an entirely new appointment to the company or somebody who's come through a succession plan, but they find themselves on the board. Given the level of responsibility that members of the board have as individuals, their fiduciary duties that they need to discharge, and the dependence that the board has on each individual member being part of its constituent, it is very important that those directors new to the board are up and running as soon as possible. So we don't just leave them on the board to catch up in their own good time. If a board only meets four times a year and we're dealing with a non-executive director, that's not very much opportunity for that director to really get into the flow of the company and to understand how the company works. So we need a formal process in place to make sure that new directors coming in have a proper induction. They have a proper orientation, they understand the company, its products, its services, how it operates, what its strategy is, um, so that they can make good value decisions, they can contribute to that discussion as quickly as possible. Induction is the responsibility of the chairman of the board, but typically will be implemented by the company secretary. So the company secretary will draft a policy, the policy will go to the board, the board will assess the policy, and the chairman will ultimately sign it off. And then when you have new directors, we, the, the, CEO, the, the company secretary and the chairman will look at this policy and they will roll out this induction program and the company secretary's happy job will be to, to put all that implementation into practice. Okay, so you need to make sure um, that directors understand their fiduciary duties. In smaller entrepreneurial businesses, you can have an entrepreneur who is exceptionally good at that area of business. Very, very good. Brilliant skills that he's bringing on to the board, but does not understand the company's act and how the Companies Act works and how it oversees and manages and legislates directors' fiduciary duties. So all directors need to have a good understanding of their fiduciary duties and their obligations, particularly with regards to conflicts of interest. All directors need to be given that, that information that is critical to the business. So first of all, your annual financial statements integrated reports, any management accounts that might also assist in an understanding, the MOI, which is the Bible of the company, so to speak. What are the powers that the board has? What does it not have? Then the board and committee charters. We've spoken about that role and responsibilities. All directors need to have a thorough understanding of those reserved matters and how, the, how, how delegation of authority has been given. It's useful if you have a very operational company, particularly in a production and manufacturing environment, to ensure that 
directors actually see hands on what goes on in the business. Go and visit company sites. Let them witness a production process. If you're in a mining company, send them down the mines to go and have a look what it looks like for a rock drill operator to be spending 12 hours a day drilling blast holes into the face of a rock and what it feels like to stand in a, in a lift that is so big that it can take 200 people. Set up um, meetings with, with senior staff and management who can give presentations on their areas of responsibility to the new director, risk, law, particular production operations, how the assurance processes work. And then externally, allow this director to meet with major shareholders so that they understand in, ex, um, the interests of the shareholders and the, the issues that are central to shareholders. There will be external advisors that it is important for a new director to meet, particularly an enlisted company, the sponsor of the company, who is the go-between uh, between the company and the JSE, and make sure that the company is always compliant with the listings requirements. The director must be familiar with the company's business environment um, with regards to ensuring um, around a listed environment, um, the concept of closed periods and what happens during a closed period and how that affects the ability of directors to trade um, in the company's shares. Inside information, what constitutes inside information, what constitutes something which is price sensitive is very important for directors to understand. How do they manage their conflicts of interest? How do declarations of interest um, work? And, and what, what must they do when they do have a conflict of interest and how that is minuted and how they are recused? And then, of course, if you are in a listed environment, there is a lot of training, some of which we've alluded to in these bullet points already. Okay, there may be some new um, and very specific requirements for directors that they might require. If they come with a very technical knowledge, but they don't have, a, have an accounting knowledge, you may need to supplement their accounting knowledge. If they come with a very accounting knowledge background, you may need to supplement some of their technical knowledge. And you can put all of this information, such as you can, into an induction pack for them. So all those document-based um, information, the board, um, charters, the MOI, all those financials, you can put together in a nice little induction pack, which you can give to them. And uh, you would hate to have a situation where you have a member of the board and um, nobody else knows who they are and, uh, and what they do there, which, is, which would be very embarrassing. Let's talk a little bit about board and committee evaluation. Remember, King talks about um, the importance of the board ensuring that it has an ongoing oversight over its own performance and effectiveness. So it says that the board must continue, uh, it must support continued improvement in its performance and its effectiveness and ensure that it evaluates its own performance as well as that of its committees, its chair, its individual members on a regular basis. Typically, the performance of the chairman might be evaluated by the lead independent director, but ultimately the board is responsible for determining how performance evaluations are conducted. What King recommends is that you have a formal process every two years, at least once every two years. And you decide as a board what that formal process will be. It can be internal, where you do questionnaires, or you have some internal mechanism of assessment, or it can be an external process where you get an external person in. But you must do something at least every two years. And then in the gap year where you haven't had a formal evaluation, the board should take time to de deliberate over its performance and that of its committees and its chair and its members. And typically what would happen in your formal evaluation process, there would be recommendations for improvement that would be made and you would implement those across the following year and you would continue to monitor that implementation and how those improvement processes are going. Okay, 
We talked about um, performance evaluations being conducted in various different ways, but the board must consider a method um, which it believes is, a pro is appropriate for that particular board. Typically, this will fall within the ambit of the nomination committee. They will be the ones who consider what will be the best for the board, and then they take a recommendation to the board, and the board considers it and then adopts it. It must be a formal process agreed by the board, as we've said, with specific reference to objectives and outcomes, and either on a formal or an informal basis. When we, when we differentiate there a little bit between formal or informal, we can have that external provider come in, or we can do it on a discussion basis, as long as it is a formally structured idea that we will have a, an informal discussion. So if you can, if you can make that distinction there. Um, a formal process might include questionnaires and reports and, and this input from an external person. An informal process might be concluded by the chairman who might hold discussions with um, each of the board members and obtain their independent view on performances and um, particular areas of responsibility that they might have. Once complete, the results of the evaluation must be reviewed, presented to the board, and then the board can deliberate on those, those results. And then a plan of action must be put into place to address any shortcomings which um, have been identified. And that's what you would want to assess on an ongoing basis. And make sure that any improvement plans are properly implemented. Okay. The board assumes the sorry the chairman will assume responsibility for overseeing this evaluation process, but like with the induction process, it's typically the company secretary who will play a leading role in actually administrating the process. Ultimately, don't forget that it's the chair's responsibility. So the company secretary will make sure that the performance evaluations and the opportunity to do so is in the annual work plan for the board at least every two years, that in that alternate year time is properly scheduled in the annual work plan for the board to deliberate. That recommended um, formal processes are, are taken to the board as to how they can conduct this evaluation and that the results of the evaluation are reported on and that those improvement plans are actually implemented properly and reported back on. Okay, most importantly, we do need to tell our stakeholders about this evaluation process that we undertake. Nowadays, boards are very um, good about telling their stakeholders that they have conducted these evaluations and then they give a pretty general statement around we are six, we're happy that we keep to our charters um, and no real further information is disclosed. There is quite a bit of pushback now from uh, shareholders in particular who want to know what uh, went wrong, what were the areas of weakness, and what levels of what improvement in, uh, implementations were made. So King specifically says that the board should disclose to stakeholders their performance, that these performance evaluations were conducted, how they were conducted, so that uh, whether they were internal or external, and whether there was a formal um, evaluation or whether there was an informal evaluation what areas of responsibility were evaluated? Was it the board, the chair, the committees? The results of those evaluations should be disclosed and what remedial actions were required and what has been implemented. And then whether or not the board is satisfied that the evaluation process is actually going to improve its effectiveness. So bullet points there three and four Typically, we are not great in the corporate community on reporting on those things. Go and have a look at the governance reports and integrated reports and see if you can find some companies that have been a bit braver than others around reporting their shortcomings. Here is an example of how you could do an internal but formal questionnaire 
style of um, a performance evaluation. And what I've done is I've just taken um, guidance from King. Uh, so you'll see the first topic deals with leadership, ethics, and corporate citizenship. The board governs the company ethically and effectively with due regard to integrity, competence, responsibility, accountability, fairness, and transparency. And then they can give it a rating on five, four, three, two, one, five being the happiest and one being the saddest. And um, we collect all those ratings together and it gives us an opportunity to then assess and rate ourselves as a board. You might then develop those questions further on through the King Report and include some questions on your chairman and your CEO and your CFO. And you might develop something very similar for your audit committees and your remuneration committees, etc., specifically with reference to their duties and their responsibilities. And there's a nice little cartoon to end off and say thank you very much for listening. And one would hope that as our directors came out of the board meeting, uh, they actually understood what it was that we